Hey folks, Nick Colbertson here, and today we're making a MIDI Atari Punk console in a hundred lines of code. A hundred lines of code. Let's get started. So what the heck is an Atari Punk console? Well, it's basically a super simple synth circuit using two 555 timer chips, and it's controlled with two knobs, one to step between frequencies and the other one to control the pulse width. Collins Lab had an amazing video showing off the Atari Punk console in its full glory. For our punk console, we'll instead be making a MIDI controller using the Arduino Leonardo to power an iOS synth using AudioKit and 100 lines of code. Once again, the code for this and all the 100 lines of code examples are up on GitHub. So first we'll start by adding some packages to a new Swift file. We'll be importing AudioKit for the audio engine and MIDI controls, controls for some on-screen knobs, SoundPipe AudioKit for effects and oscillators, and Audio Toolbox for additional MIDI support. Next we'll create the basic building blocks for creating a SynthPunk console class that is an observable object where we'll create our audio engine instance that is passed to our view. We'll add a MIDI listener to our class and if we click on the little stop sign, we can import the MIDI methods. Now I'll minimize the methods that we aren't using and also, something to keep in mind is that in the future, AudioKit might switch to using MIDIKit, so if that happens, I'll let you know in the pinned comment. If you don't like having these methods clutter up your main class, you can create a class extension and move the method somewhere else. So let's do that and move the methods out of the way for now. Okay, so next we need something to play. We'll create a variable for a pulse width modulation oscillator and give it an amplitude of 0.1. There's also a good example of using the pulse width modulation oscillator in the AudioKit cookbook, which is also good for cross-referencing. Now we can set up our engine connections in the init method. We'll pass the oscillator to the engine's output and start the engine and the oscillator. Now if we run the app in the simulator, you will hear the oscillator oscillating. To control the data of the oscillator, we'll create a struct with variables for pulse width, frequency, root, and frequency index. Those last two we will be using to grab a note from a notes array. Next, we'll make a publish variable for our data and listen for changes to the data and update the user interface when the values are changed. We'll access the didSet method, and now if the frequency index is greater than or equal to zero, we can start the oscillator and set the pulse width and frequency to the values we pass it. Now for the fun part, let's start building our layout. We'll add our radial gradient to the background and some state change observers for starting and stopping the engine. Next we'll add a stack and add a small knob from our controls package. This knob takes a value in a range, so we will pass it our pulse width, and if you right click and jump to definition on pulse width modulation oscillator, you will see that the range for the pulse width is 0 to 1. So we'll add that as our range and we should have our first knob working. Ship it. Next, I'll add more knobs to our layout, but we need something to control with them. So we'll add in a MoGladder low pass filter and the new Apple Distortion. Rather than publishing the entire MoGladder class, we'll create a local cutoff variable and apply its value to the filter's cutoff value in the didSet method. Now this step is optional, but since the Atari Punk console steps between notes, I wanted to create an arpeggiated chord bank to make things more musical. These values I've selected are to make add nine chords in the key of C, and we can update our frequency value value to find the notes index using our root and frequency index. There's some magic number math going on here, but it works, so let's move on. I guess the important thing to get from it is the idea that whenever you turn the knob, the value is pointing to another value that is in the array. All right, we'll update the values and range for our knobs and update the output connections by passing our oscillator to the filter, our filter to the distortion, and our distortion to the engine's output. This Apple distortion has some presets that you can load to add some quick multi-effects to your sound. It's really cool. Let's run it and see how everything works. The top right knob selects the note of the chord, the top left controls which chord is being played, the bottom left is the pulse width, and the bottom right is the filter's cutoff. Next, we can add our MIDI hookups. We'll create a MIDI class variable in our init method and we'll pass our self to the MIDI listener and call open input on MIDI. Then we'll close the MIDI inputs when we leave the screen and open the inputs again when we return. All right, we're getting there. 
We're now finally ready to write our logic for the MIDI knobs in the receive MIDI controller method. Here we can check if the controller, which is our MIDI CC number, is equal to the controller number, then do something with that knob value. Now we'll populate the controller info with the same info we had for our small knobs, only we need to normalize the number between the range of 0 and 127, which are the minimum and maximum values for a MIDI CC message. So this puts us over our line limit by two lines. Well, it turns out this example is already pretty lean, but one place I can cut a couple of lines is by removing that MIDI listener method out of the extension and putting it back into our main class. And now when we scroll down, we have an Atari Punk console and a hundred lines of code. All right, let's run it on the iPad. And I can also test out controlling it on macOS using my Arturia MIDI keyboard. This is great and all, but we want to control it from our own MIDI controller. So I've written this little script using the control surface library to make our Arduino into a MIDI controller. In a previous video, I showed how to make a MIDI controller using the Arduino and this same library, and I'll link that in the description. But basically in the script, we set up our control surface, call it in a loop, and assign potentiometers to pins on the Arduino with a corresponding MIDI CC value. Here are the parts we'll need. A microcontroller. This is the Arduino Leonardo. I really like using this one for prototyping. Apple's Camera Connect kit and USB to USB micro cable. A breadboard with jumpers and 10K potentiometers. A cigar box for an enclosure. Some male to female jumper wires and some knobs. All right, so first we'll get everything wired up to our breadboard. These kinds of pots are really nice because you can stick them straight into your breadboard. Then we'll run one of the outside legs to our ground and the other one to our five volts on the Arduino. You might be able to do it with the three volt rail too. I don't remember. Anyways, I did it with five volt here. Next, run the center pins to the analog inputs on the Arduino. Now we can plug the Arduino into our computer and upload the sketch after selecting our board and port. These lights right here, you see these lights right here? That means magic is happening. All right, now for a quick test, we can keep the Arduino plugged into the computer and see if everything is set up correctly. It should be recognized in the macOS simulator. Here's a close up of everything wired up. There's no schematic for this, but it's all pretty basic if you have all the parts. And now let's try running it on the iPad. Next we can move on to building our enclosure, and yes, I'm still awful at drilling holes. I think it's because the camera's in the way. No, you're making excuses. You can clip off these little metal parts on the potentiometer to help get them high up in the holes. The threading on these pots that I bought is pretty shallow, but fortunately whenever I drilled these holes they were like the perfect size. I mean I did it on purpose, so I was able to screw them directly into the wood. And there we go. Next I'll add on some of these cool looking knobs. These are the last ones from the previous batch I picked up, but I'll definitely be getting some more soon. Now off camera, I transferred the breadboard wiring to our new circuit using our female to male jumper wires, and I connected all of the power and ground wires using the side rail of a plastic breadboard. Now that everything is working, I just drilled a little hole for the wire to go through, and hey presto, we done gone and made another MIDI controller. Also, Hannah made her own controller while I was working on this one. And that's it. Thanks for watching the video, folks. If you like this kind of content, be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, let me know down in the comments if you're making your own MIDI controllers. Hopefully this is helpful to you or at least entertaining. I'm going to do one more round of these 100 lines of code things. Next time we're going to work on 
various samplers. That's one of the coolest things I think about audio kit are the various samplers, so we gonna do it. Anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time. A hundred lines of code.